the, the wing is doing a down day to address resiliency. Um, across the Air Force right now, suicides are up. You know, like, hey, just 2020. COVID, uh, <laughs> riots, you name it, elections, it's just on fire, right? Uh, so they took a down day to talk about resiliency, and I thought your story and your resiliency would be a great inspiration for these individuals, uh, and then an also opportunity just to talk about a pilot shift and uh, all that good stuff. So uh, kind of the way we're going to run this, uh, I'll do a quick, just kind of hit some highlights of their bios, and then... We're just going to kind of ask some questions. I'll uh, ask some questions to let them kind of talk about their story. Uh, kind of from last mission uh, they got shot down on to, through today. Uh, and, and what got you through that. And just um, how your resiliency played a role in letting you guys sit here today at the young age of, I don't even want to guess. Right? <laughs> I'm within a few months of 90. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, after this, um, we can talk as long as you want, or as short as you want. Uh, we'll probably convene to the bar again, and then we're going to do a, a, a roll call, uh, start a, a tank dedication, that giant piece of uh, iron, Russian iron you see out there. Uh, You're going to feed us, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to feed you, Lieutenant's going to feed you. Uh, the LPA, so. Uh, and then we'll do a tank dedication, roll call, and just have a good time. All right, so. First, I'm going to, Mr. Barnett, uh, so Colonel Barnett, uh, just a few highlights from his bi biography. Uh, born in L.A., uh, you enlisted in the Coast Guard first, correct? Three years, three days. Right. Go Navy. Uh, in 1946, uh, in the Coast Guard as a radio man. I could pay for a few of you guys. You went to college and, and then commissioned as a second lieutenant. I went to U USC. ROTC to USC, thank you. Okay. That is awesome. Um, and then you started active duty in 1953, is that correct? Yep. All right, they went to pilot training in Laredo Air Force Base, Texas. Um, and then the thing I got to highlight through all here is for both of you guys is like the amount of airplanes you guys have flown. So you get, from your bio, you went to the F-86 Echo Foxtrot, yep. uh, then the F-86 Delta. Yep. I like the one down here. Right? Okay. Right yeah, and, uh, and then then you went to F-89 Scorpion, uh, I said in uh, Kapovec, Iceland. How'd you get an assignment in Iceland? I did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly certain most of us couldn't identify what F-89 is, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, then you went to Duke Air Force Base, checked on the F-100, is that right? Uh, then the F-101. Yep. Uh, looks like you said Hamilton Air Force Base, California. Uh, and then 83rd, 84th, fighter and separate squadrons at Hamilton. Uh, Spanish language school? Si. Cool. <laughs> 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 uh, and then you did some hardship time down in Ecuador, is that right? And, uh, yeah, hardship tour. Hardship tour? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then, yeah, I had a really hardship tour after that. Yeah, I was going to say that, it looks like 1966, uh, got checked out in the F-105. All right, uh, went to Thailand. Yep. Spent some time, maybe a little extra time in Vietnam. Right. Which we'll let you talk about that here as you go through here. Uh, once you got done, looks at the University of Arizona. Yep. Uh, to teach there, ROTC debt commander. Yep. And then retired in 1977. Correct. All right, and then retired from flying in 1997, accumulating 7,325 flying hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's awesome. So, your career in a nutshell, sir. Uh, it, it, it sounds pretty awesome. Uh, so, we'll let him talk here in a minute. Uh, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Story, uh, kind of go over you. So, you're from the KCMO, Kansas City, Missouri. Yep. Yeah. Got a few of those guys here. Western <laughs> Illinois University. All right, uh, 1953. Uh, aviation Cadet Program flew the T6, T28, T33. How many jets are we right now? F-84 Golf, the Thunder Jet. Uh, gunnery training, Luke Air Force Base, Arizona. Uh, career war ended, then you joined the Guard. Is that correct? Illinois Guard, uh, 1955, which you flew, the, which I assume the P-51 Mustang, T-33 and F-86, F-84. 
I lost fingers on how many airplanes it is already, and we're at 1955. <laughs> uh, <laughs> recall to active duty, uh, served in the Berlin crisis, 1961. Uh, at Toul, Air Force Base, France. Uh, then went to McDill, F-84, F-4, uh, and then RAF Alconbury, uh, which ended up being an A-10 base, to fly the RF-4 Charlie. Uh, see, 10th tact Tactical Reconnaissance Wing. Uh, then you went volunteered to go to Southeast Asia, right? Uh, Udon, Udon Air Force Base, Thailand. Uh, again, to Afghan, or sorry, not Afghan, sorry, Vietnam, spent a little extra time there. 2,239 days as a POW. 2,239 days. Yeah. But, uh, then Air Force Academy, uh, working the, the, the Flying Operations Air Force Academy, P-41, uh, Deputy Director of Commandants. Yeah, that was Deputy, Deputy Commandant there. Fantastic. Two to ten years. Uh, let's see, then went to Japan. Uh, then, is it, let's see, 1986 retirement? Retired over there, yeah. Uh, and then, now you're back here with us. 15 years in Japan. Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're well oriented to Orient, I guess, or East, Southeast Asia. So, um, that's them. Obviously, uh, some pretty incredible stories. But uh, for the resiliency piece, I'd like to kind of dig into the PW piece of that. Uh, but just start out, maybe Mr. Story, you, you first just talk about the, the mission that led up to you being. Um, how you ended up getting, getting the PW? Yeah. It's all you, sir. For me to start? Uh, you okay. can start, and then we'll have a Colonel Barnett. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll notice my hat. It says Air Force One. I got that from Richard Nixon when I got home. I just thought I'd wear it today. That's great. Uh, okay. Uh, Went over in 66 to uh, Udor, Thailand, uh, flying RF-4s. I, I flew fighter airplanes and, uh, and gunnery and everything, and then all of a sudden, the uh, uh, commandant uh, or the head of the tactical air command sent me and a couple of my buddies over to England and uh, in RF-4s, and uh, I was I was the head of Stanley Val uh, at McDill, and then I, I ended up in the same job over there, going from F fours to R F fours, and we took a whole squadron from England over to uh, <coughs> Thailand, and uh, inter intersea trip over there. We we flew all our airplanes back to uh, uh, air base up in. Uh, South of, or in uh, uh, Idaho, uh, and they camouflaged them because they were all nice and white. Uh, uh, they camouflaged them and put the Chinese. There, well, that something that would notify us when uh, the uh, missiles were launched at us, and. Uh, we all hit our tankers off the course, off the coast of uh, California. Flew with them into uh, Hawaii. Spent the night there. Launched with our tankers and flew them all the way to Guam. Spent the night there. The next day we launched and uh, out of. Uh, out of Guam and uh, tapped our tankers just before we got to the coast of Vietnam and uh, flew across the DMZ, the whole squadron, and landed in Thailand and started flying combat the next day. Uh, it's in the 66. Uh, the, mi the mission, I, I, we were getting ready to fly a, fly a mission, a backseater guy, Ron Masson from Kansas. And he's still alive too. Uh, 
we uh, we had a mission to go photograph some uh, army camps of the Vietnamese up up north and uh, this we're getting ready to go to the airplane and the squadron commander comes in and says your mission's been changed and uh, directly from the Pentagon so we scrambled to plan the mission because we had a target time and uh, this was just after LBJ declared two weeks stand down over Christmas and so this we were the first mission out of Thailand in the North Vietnam after this two week break so you can imagine what that was like now well, up until then we had kept track of where all the the missiles, the, the big guns, uh, the, the fighters, everything in North Vietnam. We knew where all that stuff was. So when you fly a mission up there, you know how to evade all that stuff. So uh, after two weeks, you can imagine, we were the first ones in the valley after the Christmas truce. And they changed our mission at the last minute to clear up by the China border at uh, Viet Tri, which is a town where their big their steel mills are located, and they wanted some photographs of that. So we took off. We had a target time of 4 p.m. and we we flew up there and. Uh, Got down on the deck, went all the way across North Vietnam, up by the China border, and we're coming down a valley into the target area, and the whole world came unglued. It was, it was like a waterfall in reverse. Only it was 37, 57 millimeter guns, all fired straight up. And this is something that the Vietnamese did. It, uh, they lined the valleys with guns, but you don't know where they are. And, uh, and then you're on the deck coming into the target and so forth, and they unload this stuff. Well, we took three hits going through there. And so we started heading for the Gulf so we could get picked up. And uh, my back seater says, I got, I got fire in the rear cockpit, Uncle Tom. I said, oh boy. I said, so I, okay, punch out. He punched out, landed down the valley, got captured. I was up in the mountains, stayed with the airplane, and I finally had to bail out because there was no control left. And uh, I ended up in the mountains. And uh, it... It took them over a week to find me. What they did was they surrounded the mountain. They, they, you know, they saw me go down. They surrounded the mountain, and they just slowly over the days just worked their way up the mountain to well. I found a cave up there that I was holding out in and uh, and talking to. Uh, I had to radios and everything, he was talking to all our rescue people. Uh, they couldn't get in there because I was so far north, you know, by the China border. And so they, uh, they had dogs, and the dog found me, and started barking and carrying on. And I was gonna shoot the dog, but all of a sudden, uh, I saw these guys coming out of the hills and they were all shooting at me. I got hit and, uh, and captured. And they, uh, I couldn't walk because I tore up my right, my right leg and, uh, and I 
broke something in my back and I was been shot, so they came up and they said, okay, down the mountain. And so I basically crawled down the mountain. And uh, they worked me over there, got me in a truck, and uh, eventually I ended up in the Hanoi Hill in uh, Hanoi. So uh, I, was, I had about Let's see, in those days you'd get a hundred missions north and you'd go home. And uh, I was about halfway there. Uh, I got shot down in, in January 16th in 67 and uh, came home in March of 73. Uh, I was away from my family for about seven years, and uh, when I got shot down, this is my son Kurt, right here, taking pictures. He graduated from the Naval Academy, spent 30 years in the Navy, and retired. Got a job, civil service job working for the Navy on F-35s, and uh, my wife, about three years ago, had a stroke, and we had her in a rehab center for two years, and she, a year ago she passed away. Um, my, my daughter, I had, I had a son and a daughter when I got shot down. Kurt was three, we were living in England, I left him there because I had a job back at uh, at uh, headquarters there in England when I got my hundred missions north. And uh, Kurt was three, my daughter was nine. When I came home, Kurt was eleven, and my daughter was sweet sixteen. And my daughter, my wife, raised these two kids, and they're just fantastic kids. She did a beautiful job. And uh, I've got five grandkids, two great grandkids now. I have lived here in Tucson, Arizona for uh, 23 years. And uh, when we moved here, because my, my daughter and her kids were living here, Kurt was up at year in Seattle and we're kids. Yeah. So, uh, we moved here because I had a, I lived in Tokyo for 15 years. My last assignment was the head of the Army Air Force Exchange Service. And I spent three years over there. I had uh, mostly Japanese working for me. Uh, and when my, I retired over there and uh, Myself and several buddies and uh, Japanese friends started their own business over there. We ended up staying 15 years. Shelby came in one day and said, Tom, we got to go home. All our grandkids are growing up. So we had a choice of Seattle, Washington, or Tucson, Arizona, because my daughter was living here. Kurt was up in Seattle. I had enough rain, mildew, Stuff that lasts me a lifetime living in Tokyo. So we picked the desert. <laughs> and uh, we moved here in uh, 97 and uh, been here ever since. We built a house over there at Tucson National. And, uh, and I was playing a lot of golf then, but I tell you, I, I uh, have a hard time walking now. And I quit playing golf about three years ago. <laughs> The, uh, let's see, it, uh, we, when we came home, uh, we all, we all got invited by Nixon to the White House and had, had some dinners and stuff there, and, uh, that's where, that's where that hat came from, and, uh, Let's see, what else? 
Any question? So I'll come back to you. We're going to bounce back and forth if that's okay. Uh, I will come back to you. I'm going to bounce back and forth if that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to let uh, Colonel Barnett catch up a little bit. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, also tell us about your experience, which uh, I didn't highlight this, but he spent 1,986 days in confinement. Um, also a long fucking Actually, time. Actually, I'll call it 1,989 days. Holy shit. <laughs> 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 but who's counting? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> so, so, sir, 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 same question to you. If you don't mind just explaining your, your mission that got you where you yeah. to be a PW, and we'll, Colonel Story will come back to you after that and kind of talk about time and confinement. Well, one thing that's uh, unusual is uh, Tom and me were both captured by a dog. And most guys got caught down up there would uh, get picked up right away. Mm -hmm. I was running around in the jungle for two nights and three days before I got caught. So this it's a little unusual that way. Mm -hmm. But I was uh, flying 105 Thunder Chief out of uh, Broad Air Base. Wayne Fulham moved to my squadron, and uh, we thought a lot of him. And in fact, when I was looking, you, I was thinking that you're your dad was Wayne, but actually your dad was Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I had, of course, uh, going around the Air Force, and I finally ended up at Karat, and uh, we were, we were uh, calling run, Rolling Thunder. We were, we were bombing, trying to stop uh, all stuff from coming south, and uh, this, I was on my 43rd mission, 25th to Hanoi, and as Tom suggested about every mission up there as far as being shot at was about like that. But uh, also Sam's. And uh, the day I got back, uh, we were bombing the uh, a little pontoon bridge. In fact, on my sixth mission, I bombed the same bridge. And now we're going back to bomb the pontoon bridge. And I was leading a flight of four. We were flying what's called pod formations. Uh, they tried all different kind of tactics through the years over there. We were first started out coming low, popping up, and finally decided on, uh, okay, we're gonna fly at 10 every morning and two in the afternoon, and we're gonna go in a pod formation with weasel flights out in front. So the, the, the formation I was in, there's uh, 20 of us. Uh, the weasel flight had two weasels and two uh, F or D models with them, and they were to be about 10, 15 miles ahead of the force. We uh, took off from Thailand, flew over the Gulf of Tonkin, up the Gulf of Tonkin, refueled, dropped off the tankers, head up to the wart, as we call it, turned it bound, and it was a straight shot into it. This target was just about 15 miles north east of uh, Hanoi. And as we were approaching, they were calling Sam's and this, and I had, I had indication that it was Sam's. I was looking down, and uh, I was about one minute out, uh, just about ready to light the afterburner. And this thing went off right behind me. It didn't hit the airplane, but it uh, blew into the airplane, and that's porpoising, red light. And my wingman started shouting at me to jettison. So I made a turn, a 180 degree turn, as I was rolling out, I felt the flight control was getting stiff. 105, uh, uh, that flight control uh, had a tendency to pitch up, and, but we did have a lock where I locked the stab where I could fly level, and then I could, with the flaps, I could control the heading. So you're supposed to fly at 360 knots, which I did, and I, Called my flight over, talked to them, told them what I, what I had. They'd come with me, and just about that time, I lost my radio, and of course I, I knew I was going to jump out, hope to get to get to the water, and uh, I, uh, I had a in fact, I, I don't know. I think uh, I sent Roger Engelson, uh, who was stepfather of the. Poems and he was a good friend of mine in jail. Anyway, I sent him an audio tape. My number four man had an audio tape of my whole, whole thing. You know, I think I sent him that. I don't know if you guys got that one or not, but anyway, that's me. Yeah. And uh, anyway, 
and the number of four men described all was going on. I was on fire, and then I wasn't on fire, and then I was on fire, and then finally the <laughs> airplane engine came to a screeching halt, and I was about 10 miles from the coast, so ejected. And uh, went on the airplane at about 360 knots at 16,000 feet. And as I came out of the airplane, I stabilized, looked down, I saw the flash of the airplane hit right between my feet, so it went straight down. And then I looked up in my uh, raft, where you sit on the raft, <coughs> open first. So the raft went up, and then my parachute went up and wrapped around the lanyard. And I looked up then, and holy shit. <laughs> so I got my knife out and I well I could cut it off and uh, so I put my knife back and I was kind of going down beautiful day I was watching Hanoi and High Falls <laughs> <laughs> back around finally I was getting close to the ground so I put my feet together and went ricocheting through these trees and I felt myself banging off branches and I, my legs hit like that and then I fell into a big bush and fortunately start feeling I'm like, God, I got all my pieces here. <laughs> and uh, so I pulled the parachute out. And, uh, finally, after a little thrashing around, I got uh, I got contact with the people that were capping me, told them I was okay. Uh, I, did, I had broken my back, but I didn't know that. Uh, I, didn't, I was so hyped up by that time. Uh, anyway, I uh, said, okay, and I found a little spot to get picked up, and you ever hear of the fickle finger of fate? Well, that's what happened. A Navy pilot punches out the same time in Haiphong Harbor. And the helicopter that was already going towards me said, oh, go get the Navy guy. So they went and got the Navy guy, and then they didn't have enough fuel to get me. You should have told them you were in the Coast Guard. <laughs> 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 I didn't get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so they said, uh, okay, we'll come the next day. So I wandered up, found a little place to spend the night. Of course, spend the night like that. And then uh, it was getting light, and I worked on my way up the top, and there was a big, tall elephant grass. I called in there, and I could hear people now coming looking for me. And about this time, some Navy A1s came by, and I talked to them. And, uh, then pretty soon they were getting close and I told them I was going to get captured. I said, I'll see you after the war. And these people walked through, didn't see me. And I just there, stayed for a while and then they went, got kind of quiet. So then I got up and finally started moving down this ridge. And I thought the, they'd call the search off. And next thing I know, there's some A1s again. So I get on the horn and talk to them. They said, there's a helicopter. Uh, 30 minutes out, and I, oh, I don't know about this. So finally found a place where I could shoot the flare up to a tree, and okay, let's go for it. So I talked to the helicopter, and he's coming over, right over the top of me, and about that time, bullets go flying through the air, and the helicopter pilots are saying, mayday, 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 and he dumps it, and I start chasing him, and he cuts off, and I found out later, that they made it out to the water. They'd hit their fuel tank and run out of fuel, but they ditched the helicopter, but they all survived, fortunately. And then I found a little ditch, and I laid there and put my mosquito net over my head, and about 10 guys come by and walked by and didn't see me. So I, but at that time, I figured I was invincible, and <laughs> invisible. But so anyway, I. Finally waited a while, and then I started to figure I need some water, so I kind of skinny down and found a little place or some water. Coming out of the ground, went about 20 feet and back on the ground, so I got my my uh, little bag out and filled it up, took my pills and drank the water, and yeah, that was pretty good. I figured it, if I could get about 10 or 15 miles away from this place, I might get picked up. So I. Tried to move that whole day, and then it just got dark, so I camped out again on the next ridge. And then the next morning, uh, I was there was a path there. I knew I didn't shouldn't be on a path, but I'd seen people going down the village, and I thought, well, they'd 
they're still down there and it's early in the morning I'd maybe get out of there before they'd find me so I got up and I was on the tra trail running and all of a sudden uh, somebody fired a gun I don't know I dropped down and crawled around and got up and started running again and so I then I started kind of going along and pretty soon I heard some noises behind me so I ran and got under a bush I was looking and here's about five guys with spears and loincloths and about five guys in uniforms. So they, the dog, and then I saw a dog. And the dog went right in, started sniffing around my head. So this guy came with a pistol and he finally saw me and hands up, hands up. And uh, I was far enough from Hanoi that I, we haven't been bombing these people. A lot of people, you know, don't, don't don't jump out to a place you just bombed. But so anyway, they all kind of giggling and laughing. And uh, of course, took off my flight suit. But they let me keep my boots. And we wandered on down. And as wandering down this path, there was a snake about from here to the wall that they had found and killed. And I thought, well, oh, gosh, I didn't think about that during the night. You know. <laughs> so, anyway, I got down to down to the little village and pretty soon they, I still didn't have a I wasn't blindfolded then a truck came up and a guy in the uniform came up had me blindfolded and uh, and then he gave a little speech I could hear him and they all clapped and then he started interrogating me you know name rank seal number and just to make a long story short uh, I was taken into a village put in front of a bunch of people you know murmuring like a look at a I just came from Mars, and uh, then that night uh, they tied me up. Came in the next morning, started working me over, put me in the ropes. And we got to know the ropes pretty well. Uh, they tie you up and like that, and pull the rope and squash you down. And I uh, thought, well, I don't know how much of this I want. And he wanted me to write what I've been doing since I shot down, and uh, I don't know about. It. So I rode, I, I hid behind a tree, and I'm riding this under duress, and I, I thought I was gonna get court-martialed. But I thought, you know, how much do you want of that? So then they, they said, now you're gonna be a uh, decoy with a rescue airplane. That's what she said. Okay, uh, how am I gonna get out of this one? So anyway, they blindfolded me, take me down to a gun site. And by this time, there had been a big flap between the Navy and the Air Force because the, the guys at Truck didn't think the Navy was doing enough to pick me up, which they were. But so they sent the whole strike force. Uh, and I'm there, and they, I hear them calling. My, my call sign was Ozark Lead. The kid, Ozark Lead. Uh, Ozark Lead. And the guy gave me my radio and said, I said, what do I say to him? He said, tell him you're alive. So I said, I'm alive, come save me. I'm alive, come save me. I'm alive, come save me. I'm alive. And then this is going on. And first, then I, pretty, I heard him say, uh, sound your beeper for five seconds if you uh, read us. So I gave the radio to the guy, and I said, they want to hear the beeper. So he turned the beeper on, beep, 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 a couple minutes, and gave it back to me. Then I said, uh, I've been thinking the whole time now, what can I say? Uh, I thought, well, I'm just going to lay it out there and see what happens. And I said, the code word is LAM, L-A-M. Code word is LAM. We had no code. And the guy looked at me and said, what you say? And I said, well, the code word is LAM. He said, what's that? He said, I, I means I'm okay. So he kind of, so pretty soon I hear him say, uh, we're not coming down. So they're all looking and all of us, the airplane's going, he looks around and he says, uh, how come they go away? And I said, because of you. He said, no, because of you. I said, because of you. And I because of you. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I said, well, you sound the beeper for about two minutes, and they only won for five seconds, and they knew that that was wrong. He said, no. He said, you have a very sad voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then he bundled me up and took me to another gun site that afternoon. And... Uh, I thought the force came in, and I thought that might have been your grandpa, but he was a day after that. 
And I think they they were bombing Kemp, weren't they? Kemp, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I got a silver star for bombing Kemp, by the way. Anyway, then I was taken into Hanoi and uh, taken into what we call the Navi Room. And I spent, uh, so I spent, uh, let's see, two nights running around, one night tied up, one night on a, or they drove me, in, I was on a fuel tank, and drove it in, it was four days when I got there. Got there probably about 2.30 in the morning, put me in the Navi room, kept me awake for another three or four days, and uh, put me in the ropes again and all that stuff. And you finally get, uh, I was uh, hallucinating, and it's, uh, it's uh, pretty tough. Then it got tougher. <laughs> so, 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 so that's what, what I wanted to dig and do next. Yeah. Uh, sir, for you, to tell a story, can you just talk about a little bit, as much as you want to talk about your time in captivity, uh, where you went, what it did to you, and then what, you know, that part, but what got you through it, like mentally, uh, to get you through that six years. Okay. Uh, but it ended up the, like Bob said, uh, going through the torture chambers and everything, and then uh, they uh, throw you to camp, and uh, I was in isolation for quite a while. Uh, and uh, I learned that the tap code. We had a tap code, and uh, I learned that from uh, one of my cell neighbors, and uh, and that's the way we we communicated up there. Uh, we, we we basically took the alphabet, twenty-six letters, okay, uh, and each letter was a was a certain tap. And uh, we survived with the tap code up there, and uh, I ended up with a with a cellmate, and uh, we lived together for a couple of years. And then uh, I uh, ended up at uh, Sante, which was uh, this was all in Hanoi. I ended up in a, in a camp. They moved this. They, they, they discovered that we were using a tap code, we were communicating, so they wanted to break us up. So they took a whole bunch of us and took us uh, about, I don't know, 60 miles west of Hanoi uh, to, a, to a camp they built out there. We called it Sante. Uh, there was about 60 of us out there, I guess. Were you ever Sante? No. No, okay. Uh, I, there was about 60 of us, and we were out there uh, a couple of years. Uh, the Americans knew we were there, and uh, in uh, 68, the Americans raided that camp, it was called the Sante Raid, they raided that camp, and when they got there, we were all gone. And fortunately, they didn't lose anybody in the raid. Got, they got people hurt, but they didn't lose anybody in that raid. Helicopters came in, uh, C-130s, uh, just at, uh, fighters and everything. And for some reason, the Vietnamese decided to move us to an army camp uh, between Hanoi and Sante and uh, put us in, and I had a couple of cellmates out at, uh, at Sante. They moved us in a camp. I had, there's about eight of us that got together in this army camp. And uh, then we found out about the, the raid happened when we were in this army camp to rescue us from Sante. And that really upset the Vietnamese, so they, uh, after we lived there for a little while, they moved us back to Hanoi, in the Hanoi Hilton, and uh, 
and that's kind of where, where we stayed until uh, the war ended, uh, no, we went through except they, uh, after the time they moved us back to Hanoi, uh, all of a sudden the B-52s started coming in, and uh, they decided anybody could that walk and get in on a truck, they moved us all up to the China border to protect us, I guess. Uh, and there was a lot of bombing going on in Hanoi and so forth. Uh, we uh, we stayed up there. How long were we up there? Uh, actually, a little bit out of sequence. When the About bombing, a year or so. The, we hadn't bombed up in that area for three years. So in 1972, in the spring in May, they started bombing again. Yeah. And that's when they took 242 of us, crammed us into trucks. I was in the, I went the same place. We called it place, uh, uh, what do we call it? <laughs> uh, dog patch. Dog patch, yeah. Up by, <laughs> right by the Chinese border. Uh, when we were leaving in the middle of the night, I looked out and saw the sign said Song Tay, and I thought, oh, we're going to China, and we got all the way up there and then we parked under the trees for all day and then we got I don't know if you remember the night we got there it was pouring rain oh yeah and uh, the cell I went into uh, we had a a river going through the, right through the place <laughs> and then somebody found a cobra in one of the places two got shot down and, and uh, we were all out in the courtyard and, and, and uh, at the uh, at the Hilton, and uh, they dumped they dumped the B-52 pilot in there with us, and uh, and he he came up to us. And we've been there for umpteen years, okay. And he came up to us, and he said, "You guys are more famous than the Lone Ranger." <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, anyway, he started talking to us, and and. Uh, One of the guys noticed a bracelet on this pilot's wrist, and he says, uh, "You know, I'd be a pilot wearing a bracelet. Uh, you know, he says, what, what's that bracelet on your wrist there?" And he says, "Oh, uh, these bracelets are all over America and." Uh, a bunch of students at uh, at the University of California started this group and started. Anytime somebody shot down, they got everybody's names, the POWs, and they produced these bracelets that uh, had the POWs name on it when they were shot down and so forth, and they were peddling them all over the country, probably a little before your time, and. Uh, they said, and, and he told them that, that, that that's what that is, that bracelet for and everything, uh, so that this guy wasn't going to pick on him for wearing a bracelet. He said, well, let me see it. <laughs> and so he picked, it took this guy's wrist and he looked at it. His name was on that bracelet. <laughs> and he'd been up there for umpteen years. And, uh, now, one, one other thing I, I want to pass on you you guys, and in a few months I turn 90, and uh, and I talked uh, enough of you to find out that probably none of you were even born when we were fighting that war over there. Uh, But I want I want to pass I want to pass on to you something I I learned to stare at concrete walls that are probably the most important things that I can talk to you young people about. I had a cellmate and. We talked, and, 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 you know, and Bob can verify this, you know, that you, you talk about everything humanly possible to talk about, and a lot of things 
that uh, everything you knew and then a lot of things you didn't even know. Uh, and it doesn't take you long to learn everything about each other. And this is, I had one cellmate and uh, One, one day we started analyzing everything we talked about. And we discovered what to me is the most important thing I learned in all the years I was over there. What we discovered was that if if you eliminated all the materialistic toys you, we surround ourselves with, what's left? And what we came up with we ended up calling the Fabulous Five. And if I could share anything with you, I want you to remember this. It's the most important thing I learned up there, and it's part of my whole life. And my wife's life. I mean, it, it, it's the most important things that you could ever realize. Fabulous Five. I want, I, want you, I want you guys to remember this, and you can add on to it what's really important for you. The first of the Fabulous Five is faith. We all got real close to God up there. And, and your country, faith in your country, faith in your fellow prisoners of war. You can just put in faith and just remember you can add a lot of things what faith really means to you. We are all very religious up there. The second one, family. We talk a lot about our families, and I tell you, I got home, the family is the most important thing you got. And you could even call some of your squadron mates part of your family, you know? Faith, family, friends. I'm telling you, I cannot believe how important friendship is I've been here 20, almost 23 years, and I have about 40 or 50 real close friends right here in Tucson, Arizona. And we love each other, we look out for each other, we help each other. Faith, family, friends. next one's future. You need a future, something to hope for, something to work towards. You have to have a future. You chose the Air Force. Faith, family, friends, future. And none of it works without freedom. They all begin with the letter F. Easier to remember. Faith, family, friends, future, and freedom. When I got home, I went all over the country with the Fabulous Five. I was stationed at the Air Force Academy. That was the first assignment they got. When I got home, I was going through uh, uh, pilot training down in Texas, getting recurrent and everything, and uh, 
the uh, superintendent of the Air Force Academy came down there for one of our get-togethers, a lot of us pilots. And he asked me, he says, well, Tom, what, uh, you know, you're getting recurred and everything. Well, what, do you, what do you want to do in the Air Force, you know? I said, uh, General, I want to go to the Air Force Academy. And that was my next assignment for 10 years. I was a deputy commandant of Cap Fair and one of the three deputy commandants and I had all the flying programs at the Air Force Academy. <coughs> other than athletics and academics. That's the other two uh, deputy commandants. One of the things that I, I did later was uh, was I was flying in the Illinois Air National Guard. I got in the guard after the war was over. I came home and uh, the uh, let's see they they uh, I I got a I got a job teaching at. <coughs> Millican University in Decatur, Illinois. And uh, went back and got a master's degree. Anyway, I was teaching at the university. And uh, after the war, when I came back, I, I, this was when I was in the guard before I went to Vietnam, got recalled and everything. I taught at the university. And, and so when I got back, I fortunately got to give the graduation guess because we got back in March uh, before kids graduated and stuff and I got to go back to my high school that I graduated from and give the uh, graduation address and I talked about the fabulous five that was my basis and there was a there was a uh, an army major that was there in the audience and he heard about the Fabulous Five. So he he wrote a thing and and presented it to a a, a group that uh, was uh, that people had written things and so forth and he he won the national prize on the Fabulous Five. I thought that was kind of good. <laughs> the, uh, and so I, I was I was talking at uh, graduate I gave the graduation address uh, that year when we came home at the university I taught at for about 15 years. The, uh, so I finished Fabulous Five and everything that goes with it, and uh, I was hand, handing out diplomas and. As I was handing out these diplomas, this, this young lady came across the stage and I handed her her diploma. And she says, uh, Sir, you forgot one. I said, What's that? She says, Forever. So now it's the fabulous five plus one. Mm -hmm because it is forever. The most important thing that I've learned staring at concrete walls I just passed on to you young people, okay? Remember the fabulous five. Okay. Mr. Barnett, <laughs> uh, same thing, kind of your time to me. Well, I didn't have the fabulous five, but, <laughs> but I did have, what a lot of people ask, you know, how you put up with that. I had to deal with uh, every three, if I could just last three more months. And uh, this went on, just had short term, okay, the war's gonna end in three months, and okay, that. In fact, I remember in uh, 1970, we were in the pigsty, and in the, we called it the pigsty, it was one of the buildings in the zoo, called the zoo, it was the camp I was in. I spent, spent almost well over three years at the zoo. Anyway, we took a little poll, tapping on the wall, what do you think we're gonna get out of here? 
And I said, three months. Another one said, two months, four months. One guy said, a year. And everybody, God, a year. Three years. But then they had the Sante raid, and that kind of cut me down for a while. I figured I'd come to Sante if they did that. We're not going to get out of here for a while. But uh, we were talking about all that stuff. That, when we came home to the bracelets, uh, my wife got very much involved in that. She even went to Paris. I had a daughter that, uh, that when I left, she was, uh, she was uh, six, and I came home. She just had her 13th birthday. Uh, now I have uh, four grandkids, two great grandkids. I think I look at them and I said, you know, if I had not made the choices I made and hadn't survived, none of them would be alive today. And my grandkids, would, everything would have been completely different because things would have changed. I wouldn't have come to Tucson. Uh, but the Air Force was very good about uh, when we got debriefed and what do you want to do? And of course, by this time, I was on the list for a full colonel. And uh, I knew the flying game had pretty well gone by me. And I'd had that tour in South America, and I thought, well, how about being an air attaché or a mag chief somewhere in South America? So uh, I requested to come to the University of Arizona. Hadn't read a book in six years and went into a master's program. And uh, I was sort of a barely above mediocre, mediocre uh, student in college, but I was a distinguished graduate uh, when I finished here at the U of A. And I went on right from there to be the head of the uh, Air Force, ROTC. And I went up to interview with the president. He said, I've never had anybody go from student to head of to a head of a department in one day. <laughs> but uh, they were very good about it and I had a great time at the U of A. The detachment there was, uh, it was really fun working with the, the young man. And I don't know if Tom remembers, but he came down with a bunch of Air Force people about that time and we got together. Yep. And uh, uh, we have, uh, there's about 400 and 12 or something like that of us left. And I must say that as far as I know, we don't have any POWs in the world, unless there are people we don't know about. So uh, as far as being taken care of, uh, medical treatment, uh, we, we've, we've had the best. I've had uh, sit down dinner with uh, President Reagan when he was the governor of California, face-to-face uh, -face with Richard Nixon, uh, things that have been in the White House, uh, parades in Dallas, uh, amazing things. Uh, so we, we've been, you know, there, a lot of the troops came back to Vietnam uh, were very abused, and uh, I think that they sort of tried to make it up with POWs, I guess. Treated very well, and uh, everywhere we go, I have no complaints about anything. The way the Air Force treated me. Or, um. Good. Sir, a couple, couple questions. Thank you. Uh, just uh, one more question for both of you, and then we'll do a couple quick questions. Yes, sir. Okay. I I I got uh, one other thing I want to pass on to you that has, has meant so much to me. Uh, I, I had I have been in uh, Vietnam for in the prison camps for three years. We we never had a chance to communicate with our families or anything. And one day the Vietnamese came around the the uh, the cells and they 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 came uh, came to my cell and uh, when I had uh, one cellmate there and uh, they said. Uh, uh, I think I think Ho Chi Minh had passed away then. I can't remember for sure. Yeah, I think he had. Yeah, and uh, they said uh, we we and, and and Jane Fonda was running around the place too, uh, and we had 
people coming over from the States. Anyway, they came around one day and they said, we're going to let you write a note to your family. And that, that I've been, I think it was after I've been there about three years. And they had in their, in their hands a, a, like penny postcards, you know. And they had different kinds of pictures on them and stuff. Most of them were, were flowers and stuff like that. So they said, you know, pick out a card and, uh, and we'll let you write a few words. And if you, if you write too much, we'll throw it away. So uh, I picked out a card of two red roses. And I remember they went back and said, we'll come back later after you write something. And they gave us a pencil to write with and so forth. And so I sat there and I said, well, if I write too much, they're going to throw it away. I, I want Sylvia to get this. Uh, and they were giving this stuff, I think, to Jane Fonda to take back to the States and mail and all that kind of crap. Uh, so I said it and thought about it. And here's what I wrote on this card of two red roses. It was the first piece, the first time Sylvie even knew I was alive when she got that card. <clears throat> what I wrote was two roses, two hearts, so close, so far apart. And even to this day, that card meant more to Sylvia and I than anything else. And, uh, and since she's passed away, uh, every time I say my prayers at night, I talk to Sylvia and uh, repeat two roses. Two hearts, so close, so far apart. Okay. Mr. Barnett, any other words of wisdom for the, the crowd in terms of resiliency? Well, it's not like uh, I was in, uh, MIA for two and a half years. They didn't allow me to write. And um, same thing, uh, they had a Canadian American group come to Hanoi, and they finally, after Ho Chi Minh died, they and they, I think they were getting a lot of pressure there to start treating the POWs a little better. And so uh, we had to write these little six-line letters, and uh, it was taken by these uh, anti-war leftist people back to the states, and then they put their propaganda in it and sent it to our family. So our family had to work with a lot of stuff. Right now. Too. And uh, my wife passed away um, 2012, so I've been like you. <laughs> yeah. So we're still chugging along, and uh, like I'm in a group, like Tom talked about, we have we have what we call Friday pilots. We meet uh, every Friday, a bunch of people. Just like you're going to do in another four years. <laughs> you all be hanging around and talk to each other and talk about the great days when you're flying the A-10. Uh, what amazes me today, you look at all the different airplanes we flew. You guys fly the same airplane for 20 years or something. It's amazing. So I didn't get to fly pretty, you know how to fly pretty well. I'd give anything to do what you guys are doing. That's, uh, I just love the ground. <laughs> Well, we have time for about five minutes of questions before we gotta take a this break and get get on with it. Are you guys good for five more minutes of questions? Huh? You guys good for five minutes of questions? Oh yeah. Yeah, whatever. I'll open to the crowd. What, what questions you guys have? Uh, so I, I will say you were born in 1928, right? Somewhere around there. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you ninety two. How old are you now? I'm two years older than you. 
I remember Don't World War II. Don't miss out your about that. <laughs> uh, that's what I said. So, yeah. I'll open the floor to you guys. Any questions? All right, first guy. Gentlemen, what was your biggest difficulty reintegrating when you came back home, and how did you cope through that? What uh, was what your was, What was your biggest issue reintegrating uh, back home? Huh? When, you, when you got uh, back home, what was your biggest <laughs> issue to reintegrate with society and family? And uh, uh, can I? I'll answer first. I I didn't. It seemed to me. Going from here over to there was really hard. <laughs> Coming back, uh, well, I was we were Rip Van Winkle, you know, which has been uh, gone for the mini skirts have come and gone, <laughs> <laughs> and, and all this and all these people, uh, all this stuff that happened, you know, we didn't even know people landed on the moon for about a year after it happened. Uh, we didn't, and of course the Air Force took us down and the. Maxwell and put us through a couple about two weeks of bringing in astronauts and all this. And this is what's been going on for the last five, six, seven years. Because Tom and I, we we got guys that were there since 1964 and 65. Uh, when I got there, there have been guys that have been there two and a half years. And they, I don't know if you ever heard of them, they had the Hanoi March, where they marched the POWs right through Hanoi. and. Uh, and uh, that, they almost all got killed, you know. And then they brought them back to camp and just beat the hell out of them after the, after the, there's some guy, uh, he's pretty tough. But, uh, yeah. 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 Just tell a story. <laughs> hey, <laughs> uh, tell a story, I just want to ask you the same thing. Uh, what was your biggest difficulty reintegrating uh, back with society? Well, I, you know, my first assignment was uh, after I got back was at the Air Force Academy for like ten years. So I mean, I mean, it. Uh, I was around a lot of young people, and uh, uh, yeah, it, yeah, I would, I would say just being in that environment uh, really got me. Re-educated. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's about time for a piss break, if you don't mind. Uh, I got something to do. Yep. Yeah, I, I got a few things as well, but All right. uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I think this is the perfect thing for our resiliency day, just to hear about you guys' story. And it, to me, like, just that defines resiliency. Yeah. Uh, to go through what you guys did and be here today at 90 and 92 years old. But I have the outlook on life that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 that you guys do. Uh, after, like you said, sir, staring at concrete walls for years and years, um, I think we can take away the fabulous five plus one. Uh, that's an awesome thing to think about. Uh, and I think perfect opportunity for you guys to hear that. So uh, thank you guys. I've got a few things. Um, Probably not what Jerry's got, but um, all right. First, I got for you guys 30 mil, 30 mil shell. Okay. Maybe, a little, maybe, a little, maybe a little bigger than what the 105 and four shoots. Well, Daniel will fit in there really good. <laughs> last, last guy I gave one of those two full of tequila about three times in the night. <laughs> got a few patches for you guys. Uh, a couple of patches from the Bulldog Squadron. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you oh, guys. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, we've got uh, some coins, some Bulldog coins, and you'll see on the back some of the airplanes that uh, the, the three fourth fighter squadron has flown uh, to include uh, the F-51, the, the F-86, the F-105. Uh, should sound familiar. So there's some shared lineage here. Uh, and I, again, I appreciate you guys so much. And, it's going to be awesome. So thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. Woo! Yeah. It's right over to you. Yeah. My name is Jerry Bryant. I'm the flight captain for the, the daily flight here at DM. Last month, we had our normal monthly luncheon on the Air Force birthday, 
and that day also this year happened to fall on National POW Recognition Day. So we had our program with uh, Bob Barnett was there. Tom was supposed to be there, but he couldn't make it, and we had a POW, Tom Kirk, from up in the Phoenix area. So it was a great program, and I gave Bob and Tom Kirk the squadron coffee mug that we usually give our speakers. And so since Tom is here today, I wanted to use the opportunity <laughs> oh, to give day. him uh, coffee mugs. Got the Dadian logo, Tom's name on it, the date he came home from being a POW. On the back, it's got Old Pueblo Flight 12, his wings, and Outlaw, his call sign the day he got shot down. So enjoy a lot of call. Oh, yeah. man, that's just fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. Well, great. <laughs> and the reason that I wasn't there at that meeting because I wanted to be was I was in the hospital. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, a few weeks before that I had fallen down and broke three ribs and uh, I wasn't doing too well. And uh, I got neuropathy real bad. That was buggy. I couldn't walk hardly. And uh, they decided to put me in the hospital and give me every conceivable test available <laughs> and uh and discovered a few things and so that that but it uh, i'm doing better and uh and i'm sorry i missed that because i heard it was really fantastic so anyways, i'm glad you're doing better now that's okay. a bad thing yeah good, good deal <laughs> All right, gentlemen, it is 344. 344. Roll call starts at 354. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so take a leak. We'll rejoin outside. Don't be late, or the mayor will take my ticket.